really it's ultimately about who I am inside. And so just the idea that working week after week in the training program, and, uh, working with these the five guys that we're working with, it's it's uh, it's hard uh, in many ways, mainly because it provokes lots of defenses around my own trauma. There's a way in which uh, I feel a lot of this is about working with core trauma and, and understanding how core trauma gets in the way of being able to envision a, a, a powerful way of being homosexual, especially internally, a feeling of goodness, a feeling of turned onness, a feeling of, of, of power, uh, but of course not in the sense of power in the traditional ways that we're taught, but power in a feeling sense inside. And of course that activates all this anxiety around, I'm not powerful, I'm just going to be abandoned by my mother like I, I, I was throughout my childhood more or less. Uh, I won't get into that too much. But just generally that being with these guys ongoingly provokes in me, as well as of course for them, this ongoing relationship with core trauma. And Mitch was talking about how we're trying to do things kind of backwards from Way to, the way it is we're all trained in the world. The political orientation is to be outer-oriented, and we want to try and be inner-oriented. And of course, there's a way I think where inner, the inner world doesn't exist for most people as a beginning process of becoming inner-oriented. There's, there's no such thing as an inner world for really. you. So that's kind of hard to describe what that is, and how do you even value what that is, especially in a homosexual sense? How do you value an inner world when when it's fallow, and when we're, 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 we're brought up in a world where there, there isn't any such thing as an inner experience, really, other than maybe nebulous ideas if you've been in therapy for a while. Um, in, that sense, in that sense, what we're doing is being able to create an experience here where we can observe ourselves, observing ourselves, working on these issues. And it, it, it's a very trippy thing to have these different kinds of internal uh, perspectives on on what it is I'm trying to do here with the guys that I'm working with week after week and, and how this core process, getting into the core trauma so that we can work on alchemizing, learning how to alchemize this dark stuff into this higher gold of, of homosexual love and, and power and beauty and, and arrows. How do we do that on going? It gets so mixed up. I mean, that's a lot of the problem that I experience is that I want to focus on trying to grapple with this core trauma with the people I'm working with. And yet, how do you do that and not completely get lost in it? And keep your eye on the, on the goal, which is this wonderful experience of homosexual beauty and love. How do you do that ongoingly? How do you work with this core stuff, which is ugly and nasty and it feels bad? You know, and I'm working with these guys ongoingly. We're preparing to go into group week after week, right? And then afterwards we process this stuff and then it's all about getting into this dark stuff. With the guys that we're working with, it's dark and it's difficult and it's powerfully hard. And sometimes it feels hopeless and despairing and our you know, health sometimes gets compromised. And it, it can get very scary sometimes in that regard. And yet it's also real and it's all, it's all, this world, and it's fascinating, it's terrific, and that it's, it's all, that's a gay world in a way that I have never experienced before, and I, I've been doing these, I've been working with Mitch for you know, over 30 years, and over that time period, believe me, there are lots of different permutations and ways of, of unfolding this project of, of realizing gay spirit, realizing gay psyche, you know, these different forms, and Every form is so different, it's so interesting to me. And this form now is just even more uh, differentiated in, lots, in so many different ways. And you know, I hope that the way I'm talking about it conveys to, to some degree how, how amazingly differentiated things have become. Um, I listen to Mitch talk and I feel inferior and I think, oh my god, I wish I could, I wish I could just extemporaneously talk about things the way Mitch can. He's so accurate in ways that I feel like I'm so dumb, and my thinking, my 
thinking function is so inferior, and yet I have to struggle with it. I still have to value that I have something of worth inside that's important to share, and that other people might, might feel inspired or mirrored in some ways just by me. Wow, what a revolutionary thought when, when you know, I grew, grew up in a world where I, I didn't feel like I even existed in some ways, I think. Especially, you know, how, what does that mean? I mean, I feel like I exist in so many important ways now. Uh, at least my understanding of existence is so much more developed. And then I think back when I was a little kid or, you know, even 15 years ago, you know, I, it's like looking through a, a gauze at reality compared to how I feel like I can experience the world now, uh, mainly because I can understand myself in increasingly differentiated ways. And on that, I would say is the power of subjectivity is the inwardly oriented mission. You said it, but something like you said something like God is subjectivity. You said something like that that being ex having an internal experience as homosexual that that really is what God is. Just to be human is God. But be human in the sense of, of opening up and, and struggling with who, who you are inside. And, and again, the idea that we're, we're so used to not having an inner world or an inner experience really, except in most people's sense. The idea that there's some experience of humanness and, and psychological ways of being inside that, that are so important to cultivate. So interesting, so fascinating. How do you value that? For me, I, think, I guess that's what I've been really looking at is how do I value my own inner experience as homosexual? How do I value that? And that's been a really important question for me, and I think especially in thinking about preparing tonight. Um, just that question, how do I value, you know, the words that you put down on the flyer that are so interesting, you know, that it's so strange that you value. <laughs> This training program of homosexual psychoanalytic purpose and meaning is so tricky, and yet it's, I know inside, deep down inside, that it, it is real. And I have to somehow figure out how to align myself, all my defenses and all my trauma in a way that helps me connect that vital place inside that intuitively I know what is fascinating, what is real, what is valuable, who I am inside, and how as homosexual, I can relate to all you here in a homosexual sense. So that's all I'm going to say right now. That's four months of the training program. And I want to thank you all. That's what I wanted to say too for being here and looking at me and, and respecting me enough to listen. And hopefully you get something out of it. So I appreciate the, the opportunity to cook and develop in this way. So. Uh, okay, thanks. All right. Defenses are trying to crush down my core feeling. 
what you've been invoking as core trauma tonight. Um, so one of the things that I've been learning in being a facilitator or co-facilitator um, for Module B um, is uh, actually that I can give myself permission to relax. That I do not have to totally identify with my victim status. Um, and so I'm wanting to give myself permission right now that I don't have to align with that that anxious sense, which is actually a really strong victim in place. It's a place um, that um, is understandable based on what it was like to, as you were invoking, Chris, what it's like to grow up as a gay boy. So I can feel it even now, it's very challenging. Um, as I feel myself speaking these words, I can feel myself falling away um, in, into kind of a defensive state. Um, th there's a way that I was thinking about this this afternoon as I was preparing for tonight. There's a way that my parents were anti-psychological, meaning that they hated my psychology, they hated my subjectivity. And so I grew up in an environment that was constantly in, in, in a state of uh, kind of passive-aggressive attack on me allowing me to exist. And so that's what I'm struggling with right now in this exposure which recreates the parental matrix of, of these unloving eyes that I got from my narcissistic mother and from my father who on the outside was very meek but was actually very full of this actually raw rage that was not totally disowned. So now I also struggle then there's a way that as I invoke my childhood trauma there's a way also I think there's a violence even there um, that, in a way, as I struggle to partner these painful feelings of, how, of, of being unloved by my parents, um, there's a way that you might even feel, some of you as you're listening to you might even feel in me the, the, the struggle to partner that quality of being unloved. Um, and, and as I struggle, how can I Chris, I thought you evoked really nicely about this feeling of, can I have permission to exist in my subjectivity as a gay man? Can I feel good about being a gay man? One of the things that are, that's in the parameters for the core training program, which is our, for one of our uh, basic documents that kind of guides what we're doing. We shared that last summer here. Yeah, shared that last summer here. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, a nice phrase in there um, is, can you be good to yourself in becoming psychological so that you can apprehend true gay love? Um, how can I say, fuck you to my parents, fuck you to the way that they attacked me, so that I can actually hang out with all of you here and try and do my best to be present? What does this have to do with the training program? Well, as a, as a facilitator in the training program, the, it's been this remarkable experience where I'm um, actually, in a way, forced to walk my talk. Um, I can't, the, the, the group that I'm uh, co-facilitating with Doug once a month and then also working with uh, Dustin as my assistant facilitator on the, on the other weeks of the month, um, in order to contain the group and, and, and encourage an authentic group process, I can't, I can't afford to collapse into my victim status. I can't get over-identified with that core trauma. There's a way that I have to, I have to assert and, and, and hold an attitude that I have a right to exist, that I have a right to be honest with all of you about how I'm feeling, um, and to struggle with that. Um, in that sense, um, I, have, I find that, well, I, let me say that a little bit, just uh, for some of you who aren't in the training program, I thought it'd be worth describing what Module B is like. I think Chris did a good job of evoking that. But basically what's happening, Module B has an activity focus of reading and writing. Um, Doug and I, as Mitch mentioned earlier, Doug and I have um, created this 28-page grid of reading and writing assignments for the four-year curriculum. <laughs> I'll be as enjoying that a little after that. Um, and every month we give out a pretty heavy reading schedule. It's um, a combination of uh, 
gay and Jungian reading, and there's some other psychoanalytic reading brought in. Um, so the module B, which is sort of, so to speak, half of the training program, offers this um, monthly course of reading, and then the trainees are doing these, as Mitch was describing, these reaction and reflection papers uh, every month. So, so technically the activity is reading and writing, but this group is not at all about reading and writing in the actual felt moment of the experience. Um, similar to how Chris was evoking module A, um, it's all about how real can the trainees and us, the facilitators, get with our felt experience. 